people say, oh, you're just messing with the president because you don't like him. It's not about not liking the president. It's about loving democracy. And I'm begging, I'm begging the American people to pay attention to what is going on. Because if you want to have a democracy intact for your children and your children's children and generations yet unborn, we have got to guard this moment. This is our watch. Yeah. That was Maryland Congressman Elijah Cummings, who brought such passion and spirit to the House floor during his lifetime of fighting for justice. He was known as the conscience of Congress. And after we tragically lost him just three months ago, he became the first black lawmaker to lie in state. And right now, his widow shares his mission to continue his legacy in Congress. Please welcome Maya Rocky Moore Cummings. That was Whoopi Goldberg on ABC News in January 2020. If you're tired of arguing with strangers on the internet, try talking with one of them in real life. Welcome to Back in America, the podcast. I am Stan Bertolo, and this is Back in America, a podcast exploring America's culture, values, and identity. My guest is former chair of the Maryland Democratic Party, a political consultant and activist. She recently ran for Maryland's congressional seat just after undergoing a double mastectomy. She is the widow of Congressman Elijah Cummings, a good friend of John Lewis. Together with her late husband, she has been a fierce advocate for civil rights. Welcome to Back in America, Dr. Maya Rockemore. Cummings. I am so pleased to be with you today, Stan. So we are doing this call online, but if I were sitting in front of you now, what would I see? You would see me in sitting in the living room of my West Baltimore home, looking outside onto the street, uh, which is a actually a beautiful street. It's reminiscent of the architecture that you might see in uh, Holland, perhaps, at Amsterdam. Uh, beautiful old world homes uh, that are connected together, but it's in the middle of a very impoverished area in the United States of America, a, a neighborhood where there are too many people who live in poverty, uh, and most of them are black and brown. Well, that brings me um, to a question that I had, which is, you've been, you've dedicated your life to civil rights and, and fighting for the others. What is it that's dear to your heart? What, what do you fight for? I fight for the right to exist. I fight for the right of everyone to be recognized on the level of our common humanity. I fight for the history in this country that has been suppressed. I am the fourth generation from slavery in this country. My parents grew up in the Jim Crow South. My late husband, Elijah Cummings, grew up in the Jim Crow South. They were born into a world that denied African Americans the right to exist, uh, that actually traumatized African Americans and oppressed them and forced them into separate and unequal co accommodations from schools uh, to uh, public stores, et cetera. Uh, and so I fight for the right never to have to relive that history here in America ever again, that anybody of, that is of color, that they have all of the opportunities that are afforded any human being to rise to become the best that they can be in life. I fight for a future that is multicultural, that is pluralistic, uh, that recognizes all people are human beings across all races and also genders, uh, you know, religions, etc. I fight for freedom. Hmm. We are going to come back to that in just a minute. But in my introduction, I said that you had double mastectomy because black women are disproportionately carrier of a gene that put them at risk. Your mother and your sister were both affected. What is the situation when it comes to clinical trial for black people and for black women in general? Unfortunately, America does not have an agenda for black women's health. America does not have uh, any kind of record 
of actually pushing for government uh, regulations or even government studies uh, that actually take a, a really good hard look of, about why Black women are dying disproportionately at younger ages from breast cancer. Uh, and so with that, you know, while there is some burgeoning re research that is happening out there and some advocacy here and there, if I would have ran for Congress and won, which I didn't, uh, one of my agenda items was to push for a more comprehensive women's health agenda that would take a deep dive into these issues facing women of color and black women specifically. And so, you know, along with the racism that African Americans and uh, Native Americans and Latino Americans and others face here in this country, we also see it translated into policy racism, which means a denial of government resources to actually address the issues that disproportionately affect us. Talking of, of racism, um, I would like to come back to the legacy of your uh, husband. He was one of the most influential members of the Congress, and he's been diagnosed with cancer 25 years before his death in October 2019. And he was about to finish a book at the time, a book that you've decided to publish. Take us through the process and the legacy of your late husband. So my husband was an incredible man. As I mentioned, he uh, was born an African-American at a time in a country when a country actually turned its back on African-Americans. Uh, and it was the early 60s where he actually, as a young man, 11 years old, participated in an integration march. Uh, he and the other black kids were not allowed to swim in an all white swimming pool in his neighborhood. And so they were led on a march to that white pool where they, were, they had rocks and stones and, and bricks thrown at them by white adults who did not want to see little African-American kids swimming in the same pool as their white children. Uh, and so with that, Elijah went on to become one of the first cohorts of, of Black kids that integrated Baltimore City Public Schools. He graduated from a very prominent high school in Baltimore City. It's called City College uh, with honors. Uh, he went on to graduate from Howard University, where he was Phi Beta Kappa with honors. Uh, and then he went to the University of Maryland Law School, where he graduated and passed the bar on the first time. He went into private practice and then, of course, uh, went into politics uh, in the state legislature, becoming uh, the Speaker Pro Tem, the first ever African-American Speaker Pro Tem in the Maryland's House of uh, Delegates before he was elected to Congress in 1996. And he rose to become one of the most powerful, influential members of the United States Congress. And when he died, he left a legacy, a legacy of fighting to protect democracy, defending the United States against enemies, foreign and domestic, fighting the Trump administration and Donald Trump's corruption and lies, seeking to uplift the truth so that we could actually protect our democracy and make sure that it works for future generations of Americans. Uh, and so with that, this book was written in the last year of his life. He wrote it with a man named Jim Dale, and he recounted the stories of his youth and how these stories went on to influence his career. He had two goals for the book. One was to in encourage young people who were facing obstacles that, you know, he had a lot of obstacles that he faced as a kid but he was able to work hard and overcome them. And he wanted to encourage young people to work hard and overcome their obstacles, to recognize that they could be anything they wanted to be. But he also wanted to warn the American people and certainly the world that Donald Trump was a danger, a danger to our humanity and also a danger to our democracy. And since he died, Elijah's predictions have come true. We saw how Donald Trump uh, try to actually take American democracy apart brick by brick in his last months in office. And certainly throughout his entire tenure in office, he sought to dismantle the Constitution and disregard democratic norms. And so with that, Elijah's book will stand the test of time. It's called We're Better Than This, My Fight for the Future of Our Democracy. And I encourage all of your readers and listeners to get it. And we'll definitely do that. And I will post a link in the notes of this episode for sure. Your husband was definitely, you know, a prominent figure and a powerful man. You are also a very powerful woman. What is it like to be living alongside such a powerful history-making personality? First of all, it was an honor and a privilege because he was just a beautiful, incredible man, very spirit-filled, God-driven. 
Uh, he was, you know, he woke up every day trying to figure out what he could do to help other people. And he went to sleep every night worried about the same issues and how he could maximize his time here on earth in order to make a difference. And so, you know, we connected on the level of the spiritual. We were in so many, so many ways alike. Uh, you know, he cared uh, and pushed for civil rights and human rights. Uh, I care and push for civil rights and human rights. And so to be connected to someone who I was so aligned with on so many levels was just a privilege and an honor. Of course, he was the love of my life. And I certainly am just so deeply uh, honored that I had the time that I had with him. Uh, that being said, you know, I, um, you know, have always been a professional focused on these issues. And so I spent a career focused on uh, policy uh, and politics. I'm a political scientist by training. My PhD is in political science. And I look forward to uh, certainly uplifting the legacy of Elijah, but also to continuing to push for freedom, uh, democracy, uh, and certainly inclusion here in the United States and everywhere around the world. Because many of the issues that we're actually facing here in the United States are also apparent in France. Uh, they're in England. Uh, they're in countries across the nation, the world. And so we have to make sure uh, that we are uplifting all of humanity because I think that's the only way we're going to actually uphold the promise of a new uh, century uh, that is uh, able to leverage the best that we have to offer in terms of technological advances, but we also have to have human advances. You mentioned France, and it's interesting, last summer or last spring, uh, after the death of George Floyd, we saw a lot of demonstration in France with the sign Black Lives Matter. Many commentators said that the fight against racism is quite different in France. We've got a colonial past, but we don't have... Uh, a past with slavery the same way, although we were definitely part of the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, you know, we don't have a survivor of slavery in France the same way as you do in the U.S. What can you say about that? I mean, this country has, is divided more than it has ever been. So we've got a political divide, obviously. But we also have a racial divide. And I think for people that have not grown up in the U.S., it's quite hard to understand the experience of black people in the U.S. So I think your divide is, is racial, uh, is ethnic, is religious. And yes, while I understand that many French people are secular, uh, you know, certainly your history in North Africa uh, and your, certainly your history with Muslims around the world uh, is something that has come up in recent years as a uh, fault point uh, in your society. But anti-Black racism does not actually have to be connected to slavery. And it's actually apparent in Western Europe. Uh, you know, the whole notion that uh, whiteness uh, is actually better than every other skin color on the planet uh, is not something that's just confined to the United States of America. Uh, and so we have to beat back racism wherever we find it. We have to understand uh, that, you know, that kind of racism was apparent in colonialism as well. Uh, you know, when the colonizers went into the homelands of, uh, you know, in, in sub-Saharan Africa and took over and dominated uh, and perverted all the systems that were there to their own advantage in order to actually leverage and secure the wealth of the nations and to take them back to the France homeland. That is racism, a structural racism, but of a different kind. So we're fighting racism on every level in many societies across this country. I mean, in, the, in this country and across the world. And we need to actually come to grips with our past and understand how it influences the present. Do you have any hope for this country to actually come together? And uh, I do. Yeah. I do. I do, but it's going to actually take inclusion. It's going to have to take uh, you know, basically confronting racism, confronting classism, uplifting a new diet, uh, a new vision for the world uh, where the whole issue of oppression uh, based on, uh, you know, these, frankly, these characteristics that don't really matter much, except for the fact that some people seem to think that they should actually define our world order and certainly our social order. Uh, so we have work to do but I actually have hope. I have hope that people can understand that they've been blinded by lies, 
lies that have been historical, lies that are contemporary, lies that have blinded them to the reality that we are all God's children. And we all have and should have the opportunity to live our best lives here on this planet. And there is no characteristic that God has assigned that should be demeaned uh, or considered less than or undeserving. And so I am on a mission. I am on a mission to address this globally as well as here in the United States. And I am on a mission and I am determined to make sure that we can transform the way our societies operate, the way our world works, so that we can take advantage of all of the brilliance that is apparent and evident and present uh, among all the peoples of the earth. You are a black woman. Talk to me about black feminism and why a lot of white feminists did not understand that your fight had to be addressed maybe slightly differently than the way they were trying to process it? Well, you should understand that white feminists are in fact affected by, infected and affected by the same racist paradigm that has historically affected whites across, you know, um, certainly the Western world. Uh, and so they didn't understand that our history was different because they didn't actually care to understand because they didn't consider us to be uh, equal. Uh, and so with that, Black women, uh, as uh, you know, one writer described us, have been the mules of the world. We have, considered, we have been considered the bottom of the bottom uh, at the base of the totem pole uh, because you know, women uh, around the world are, are not considered on an equal footing with men. And certainly Black people around the world are considered, not considered, had not historically been considered on an equal footing with whites. Uh, and so as Black women, what we have been able to do is see how oppression works, how these disparities work, how the isms work in an intersectional way because they intersect in our lives in multiple ways and, uh, and unfortunately too many ways. Uh, and so we have been able to utilize our intellectual power to dissect uh, the structural isms uh, in a way uh, that can illuminate how they operate and then transform and, uh, and certainly, I, first of all, not before transforming, uh, we actually need to deconstruct uh, and then of course rebuild. And so black women in America are at the forefront of this effort to dismantle structural racism and sexism in this country. Uh, certainly white women have gotten on board in many respects and in some cases are following, but we have a mission and we are determined to transform this world to make sure that we all have opportunities, including black women. So you are on a mission and, and, and you want to change the world. And I, I believe that yesterday, the festival that you held online uh, was part of this effort to change things around. You, you held the first Elijah Cummings Democracy and Freedom Festival. And I believe that you had Speaker Nancy Pelosi as a keynote. That is correct. How did it go? Tell us about it. It was wonderful. We had an hour and a half with some incredible activists, uh, policymakers, uh, intellectuals, uh, leading people who have given a lot of thought to these issues around discrimination here, certainly in the United States. And it was certainly poignant coming only a week and a half after the January 6th insurrection, uh, where a certain faction of Americans tried to overthrow the United States government in the name of Donald Trump. Uh, and so with that, it was especially poignant that it was named after my late husband, uh, who started his life uh, certainly being discriminated against and ending his life fighting for the same system of government that once actually kept him out. And he fought for it because he believed that a democratic form of government was the best hope that we have towards working towards our collective freedom. And I agree with him. And I'm working on this uh, you know, as an annual event uh, the first event went uh, incredibly well, but we look forward to growing it and building it in future years. Wow. Do you know how many people attended? So we had 770 registrants and we had 345 participants. Good. And, and will you be posting the, the speech and everything online? Yes, I'll be posting the, uh, the event online. Okay, so we, we'll share it. Finally... My last question is always, what is America to you? America is both an idea and a possibility. 
Uh, it is a country that upholds the, the notion that you can be anyone from anywhere in the world of any background and certainly have uh, the ability to rise to become your best self, have influence uh, and to have opportunities. But that's an ideal. It's an ideal that we actually have to continuously work for. And so America has, uh, you know, historically been challenged in this area. It continues to be challenged in terms of its opportunities for diversity and inclusion. And so I am here to say that the possibility of America can become a reality. The notion of a multiracial, multicultural, uh, you know, irreligious, meaning that all religions on the world, or even if you don't practice a religion, that you can be welcome and that you can become everything that you were meant to be here in this country. That is America. And that is certainly what I'm working for. Let me ask you, what is it like to be a woman, to be black and to do politics? It is to be constantly disregarded, disrespected, to know that the reason why you're being disregarded and disrespected is because people are myopic. Uh, they haven't lifted the scales from their eyes to recognize talent and opportunity when, they, when it's in front of them. And so it's also, um, you know, the continuous effort to actually have uh, your voice heard and to uh, basically, uh, you know, fight through Uh, the negative perceptions uh, to make a difference. And so, you know, when you're continually fighting, when you're continually rubbing up against the friction of the world, what happens when that happens to a diamond, right? Uh, you know, it's something that's in the, in the ground that has to be continuously polished in order to become brilliant. And to be a black woman is to be continuously polished uh, by friction, by, by challenges. Uh, in order to become brilliant. And so with that, I claim my brilliance and I claim the brilliance of other Black women around the country and the world who are working towards liberation. Maya, thank you so much. I thank you for inviting me. I thank you for having me on today. Thank you, Maya. Have a good day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.